This episode of the GabFest is sponsored by SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos. But it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia and identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. Welcome to GabFest Reads for January. I'm John Dickerson. In this episode, I talk with Brad Stolberg, an author, executive coach, and faculty member at the University of Michigan's Graduate School of Public Health. His work is dedicated to the science behind well-being and achieving excellence. His new book is called Master of Change, How to Excel When Everything is Changing, Including You. And it explores how to stay stable in the face of life shocks that inevitably will come to all of us. It's out now from HarperCollins. Here's our conversation. Brad Stolberg, welcome to GabFest Reads. Thanks so much for being here. John, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. I first got to know you through Instagram when um, a friend of mine forwarded one of your posts, and then they became so nourishing. I started following you, then I started reading your work, and we're going to talk about Master of Change, but I just want to testify to the fact that social media is not totally awful because um, it brought me in touch Um, in touch with your work. So I want to start with, when we're talking about change, one of the things I loved was the study you cited that said there are, and I can't remember there was 36 or 38 life altering events. Explain what that means and and give give me the right number in case I butchered it. That's right. So this is uh, research that was commissioned by Bruce Feiler that found that the average uh, adult undergoes 36 major life disruptions. These can be things like moving geographies, starting a new job, ending a job, having kids, having your kids leave the house, getting married, getting divorced, meeting a new best friend, distancing from a best friend, loss, illness, recovery from illness. And what really struck me about this is that we think of change as these singular one-off events that happen to us, when in fact, we're always in conversation with change. And your argument is to be a participant in that conversation, not let change talk at you, if I can uh, steal your metaphor a little bit. In other words, to work the idea of constant change into your mindset. That's right. I think that when we view ourselves as in conversation with change, it gives us um, a sense of some agency. And that's not to say that we have control. We certainly don't. Um, But the opposite of that is just throwing our hands up and and being completely overwhelmed by the chaos of the world. Uh, Not only does that not feel good, but it doesn't really set us up to skillfully participate. Uh, It is very true that there are these tidal waves of change that can shape us, but we have some power to shape change as well. And if the first piece of the power or first part of the power is just thinking of change more broadly weaving it into the fabric of your day and your expectations and you write um, so well and and, um, it's so necessary the way you frame expectations. So, and we'll get to that in a minute. But if that's the first kind of revelation, because I think about this stuff a lot. I've written about it a lot. I'm in the middle of writing about it right now and have been for a couple of years, which I'll get to in a minute. And nevertheless, when I read your book, I was like, well, of course, like, it just framed things really well for me. So the first thing is there more, there's more change in your life than, you, than you, you think. And then I want you to help us with the term homeostasis and why that is a bad frame to think about the way change affects us in our lives. Homeostasis goes all the way back to the late 1500s, early 1600s. So it, it really dates itself to the beginning of empirical science. And anyone that took high school, even middle school, perhaps biology has probably heard this term. And it describes change as a cycle of order or stability, uh, then disorder or chaos, and then immediately trying to get back to order, to get back to where you were. And homeostasis treats change as something that is negative and that is a threat to any living system, be it an individual, an organization, even entire society and entire culture. 
And homeostasis was the conventional framing of change for the last five, six centuries. More recently, however, in the research community, um, from across different domains, scientists have stepped back and said, actually, when we look at really healthy individuals, they don't follow a homeostatic approach to change. It's not the best fit model. And they've described what they've coined allostasis, which describes change is a cycle of order, disorder, then reorder. So yes, it is true that we crave stability, but that stability is a moving target. It's always recreating itself. And I'm a sucker for words. So I, I, I love the etymology here because I think it tells the, the entire story so, so beautifully. Homeostasis comes from the Latin root homo, which means same, and then stasis, which means standing. So it argues that we achieve stability by staying the same. Whereas allostasis comes from the Latin root allo, which means variation or change, and then stasis, which again means standing. So it argues that we achieve stability through change. And it has this elegant double meaning that we can be stable through change, and the way to be stable through change is through change, at least to some extent. If I'm coming to a new understanding of change in my life, it feels like the first two steps are one, there's more of it and think of it more broadly. I mean, so one of the revelations for me is um, I was writing about a period of change. I've carried around these notebooks uh, my, for the last 30 years in my back pocket and uh, uh, a mine are made by field notes that yours look like maybe a moleskin. What are we got there? Mine are, uh, yeah, mine are moleskin. So I've been writing about what's in these notebooks and the, a, a significant area starts cold with my wife saying, oh my God, we dropped our son at college and our dog is dead. One day she said that into the middle of the living room on a, on a Sunday the fact that it was a Sunday has other significance, but because um, we get hit with these thoughts on a Sunday, don't we? But when I read your book, I was like, that's exactly it. These are life changes. And then the revelation I had was it was in the middle of COVID, basically, or around the Delta variant, which you write about. And I completely forgot that there was change encased in change. And so anyway, your your framing of the of change more broadly considered seems like the first step. The second step is don't try and wrestle the wheel right back onto the road, but recognize that life is a path, that you will change and that you will go in a new direction. Explain the difference between a road and a path since I've taken us there just uh, for the moment. It's one of my favorite metaphors for thinking about change, which I guess is to say thinking about life. A road gets you from here to there as swiftly and as efficiently as possible. When you're on a road, you expect smooth sailing. If you get off the road to make a pit stop, if you're on a road trip, generally you try to get back on as fast as possible. And when you're on a road, especially in our modern times, you can really zone out. You can just pay attention to Google Maps or Apple Maps, whatever you use to tell you exactly where to go. Um, and you get there fast and you try to make really good time. It gets you from here to there. Whereas a uh, path works in concert with its environment and it's constantly revealing itself to you as you walk it. And there's no such thing as getting knocked off a path. Um, you bushwhack, you get back on, you might have a general sense of where you're going, but it's not seen as an assault or an embarrassment to get thrown off a path. And I think that when we think about navigating our own lives, if we have this road mindset, there's really two big categories of risk. The first is that we're always going to get thrown off the road. And when we do, we're going to have freak out moments. And the second is that even if we stay on the road completely, well, then we end up at the end of our lives and we might have had the most efficient or optimized lives possible, but we'll be like, how do we get here? You know, I was in this kind of driving trance and now here I am. I'm an older person. I'm on my deathbed. Whereas when you're on a path, you have to be in touch with your environment. It's a much more visceral, intimate experience. Yes. And what I like about the idea that you've you've written about is that it's an iterative experience and um, we'll get to identity and maybe we'll just get there right now. I had thought that identity was like, okay, you form it in college and then like you add to it, you know, it's like you basically get the vehicle kind of in college, you're on your own, you build the vehicle and then like, okay, maybe you add a racing stripe or you get the mud flaps or you, you know, you get a, a, a fancy steering wheel. But I, I realized when my when my eldest son went to college that um, actually what it did to change my life 
required a whole new like vehicle. Um, and, and so you, when you write about identity, in other words, identity is not something you, you kind of add to, it's something you often rewrite at different stages in your life. Um, talk about identity a little bit in this context of, of change. Changes around us are challenging, but changes to us, to how we see ourselves, are even more discombobulating. Um, especially for those of us that have grown up in the West, there's a real prioritization on self-esteem and self-confidence and um, just self-image, having, having this standard self. Uh, so when things change, it can be seen as a threat to ourself. So the first thing that I would say that I uncovered in my research and reporting is over-identifying with any one thing that you have really sets you up for fragility. I have this house, I have this job, I have this income, I have this relationship, because all the things that you have eventually change. In, in many cases, they're, they're taken away. The second thing that I think comes up often with identity is especially in, in, in the corners of the world that I operate in where people are interested in high performance and excellence, it's very easy to say, if you want to be great at something, you have to go all in, you have to be obsessed. And I think that this also makes you inherently fragile because when you get injured, if you're an athlete or when it's time to retire, if you're an entrepreneur or when the album doesn't win a Grammy, when you're a musician um, or just when your kids leave the house and you care really deeply about having them in there, uh, it can be a, another really discombobulating experience. So the metaphor that I like to use for identity is to think of it like a house. And if you have a house that only has one room in it and that room floods or catches fire, you're in for it. There's nowhere to go. It, it's a really, really terrifying experience. Whereas if you have a house that has multiple rooms, in one room floods or catches fire, you can go seek stability in those other rooms while you deal with the flood and fire. And when you think about building an identity, I think it's about building a house. And then over time, you can renovate those rooms, you can add rooms, you can change rooms, you can spend less time in one room and more time in another room. I think it's really important for me to be explicit here. I'm not arguing that the key to navigating change or a life well lived is, is to be quote unquote balanced. Um, I think it's okay to have seasons of your life where you really do spend a lot of time in one room when you go all in, so long as you don't let the other rooms get moldy. They have to remain available to you. Right. You uh, do a really great job of helping people be super in intentional about you know finding your other rooms. If you think you've only got one room, you might actually have more. And here's the process, not just for identifying a room, but giving yourself action items that help engage you do people ever say to you, oh, you know, this is a lot of thinking about like just day to day stuff. Do I have to really be so intentional? Do I have to really um, think about thinking this much? Can't I just like live my life? You know, I think that a lot of people um, might say that. And what I would argue is, yes, you can until life gets really turbulent. Uh, and then you'll have to do that thinking in the moment. Um, but I also think that intentionality, it matters. And I think that it matters perhaps more now than ever. Uh, on the show, you've done such a wonderful job covering what I just call broadly the attention economy and just all the competing forces for our eyeballs, for our ears, for our attention in any way, shape, or form it can be had. And I think that if we are not intentional with how we spend our time and how we set our values and how we navigate the turbulent world, then forces that are really large and well-capitalized and well-resourced are going to do that for us. Um, so I do think that that being intentional is is important. Right. If you don't make the choice, Amazon is going to make it for you is is a way that that I or or Twitter or you know Instagram is gonna is going to grab a hold of your emotions and make those choices for you. And I think that there's a really important balance too between just being in your head and just thinking and then doing in the world. And I almost think of this as like a being doing cycle, right? Your your being or your reflectiveness or your solitude or you're reading a book like this and pondering it, that affects your doing, but your doing also affects your being. So how you show up in the world, the projects that you take on, the relationships that you forge, that's also going to have a real impact on like your essential uh, being. So I think that people tend to get caught in these two extremes 
of I'm just going to think and I'm just going to be a contemplative or I don't need to think about any of this. I'm just going to live my life. In like so many things, I think the answer isn't either or, but both and. This episode of the GabFest is sponsored by SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos. But it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia and identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. This episode of the GapFest is sponsored by SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos. But it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia and identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks, and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations, so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. You write often about athletes and use their examples. The the book, for those who have yet to read it and will, um, is peppered with real life examples of people going through various different uh, kinds of change. Not all of them are athletes, but they're high, m- they're high performers um, in one form or another. What is it about athletes that helps tell this story? Ooh, I think that athletes experience the kind of change that I'm interested in wrestling with in the book in a very intense and condensed fashion. Because so often athletes peak in their 20s, maybe if they're lucky in their 30s, and that is an enormous identity foreclosure, especially at the world-class level. Because to be a world-class athlete, you have to have a near single-minded focus on that thing. So not only is it this huge part of what you're doing, but it's a huge part of what you're doing to the exclusion of lots of other things. And then suddenly there's an injury or an illness, or a misstep, or just plain old aging that then takes you out of your sport. And um, that is just such an enormous transition. And again, this all happens in a really condensed period of time. And the other thing that I like about athletes is I think that there is something really inspiring about chasing after a goal and being ambitious and wanting to be great, wanting to be excellent. I think that's a huge part of the meaning of life. So For me to make this argument that we should weather change in a certain way and we should be rugged and flexible, I want to make sure that I'm not throwing out the baby with the bathwater and encouraging people just to to check out because that's not what I'm trying to do here. And the athletes, the ones you choose, what I like about it also is they're high performers. So they're not, they're not just like, Hey man, I'll do whatever. Um, But they also are super intentional about what they do because you can only achieve excellence if you, going back to your previous point, if you set a plan, stick to the plan roughly. Um, and aren't just uh, you know driven around by your by your emotions. If the the path to understanding here is first learning that changes should be more broadly considered. The second is that change is something that is um, from not from A to B to A, but A to B to C. The third question then is, or the third step for me is, what's it like to be in change? Um, one of the things that, you know, the idea of negative capability is supposed to be a key to genius that you're able to hold two opposing notions in your head at the same time, at, without grasping for solutions. To me, that that's terrifying. I mean, I understand it and I admire it, but I find it very difficult. Um, so, how does one, you know, you're sitting in the living room and you realize that, like. The dog you loved is dead. Your your kids have gone to college. Oh my, you know what? Like it all seems very uh, gauzy, unfamiliar, and no clear solutions in sight. How does one get used to that kind of change? 
I don't think you ever get used to it. I think that you become better at weathering it. So I think it's worth separating um, really challenging negative changes, the dog dying, or worse, the spouse dying, um, God forbid, the child dying, uh, the terrible health diagnosis, from still jarring changes, but less extreme changes. So a career transition, um, a big professional success or failure, so on and so forth. Uh, For the former, I think the notion is to hold two competing ideas at the same time. And these two competing ideas are ruggedness and flexibility. So to be rugged is to be tough, to be determined, to be durable. To be flexible is to be soft, to be supple, to bend easily without breaking. Most people hear rugged and flexible, and they think these are diametrically opposed opposites. Um, But in my research and reporting, hundreds of studies, hundreds of interviews, what I found is that individuals that weather life's change really well, they're not rugged or flexible, they're rugged and flexible. They draw their ruggedness from their core values, from like the essential qualities and traits and characteristics that matter to them most, the hills that they'll die on. And they hold on to those things. They don't just let go of those things. But then on everything else, they're super flexible. And they can take those core values and apply them creatively to a wide range of circumstances. So the key to getting from disorder to order to me is being both rugged and flexible. Again, knowing the hills that you're going to die on, but then challenging yourself to be really flexible. Now, for capital T trauma or very big negative changes, the most important thing is to seek support from your community, from those that you love, from your friends, from relationships, and just to keep showing up. It doesn't have to be meaningful. You don't have to grow from it in the moment. You don't ever have to grow from it. Sometimes things just suck. And all that you can do is lean on others for support and keep showing up. Let me grab a hold of that because you wrote in the New York Times that typical self-help advice didn't help you when you were dealing with an onset of OCD uh, and depression. And it made you feel, quote, feel as if you're not even good at feeling bad. Unpack that for me. What did you mean? And is that connected to what you were just saying? Yeah, that's right. So it is connected to what I was just saying. About seven years ago, I was struck by really sudden and stark onset um, obsessive compulsive disorder, which is a quite debilitating and and highly misunderstood condition, and then really bad secondary depression. Uh, For a period of about six months, it was hard for me to leave my house. I didn't want to be alone out of fear that I might hurt myself. Um, It was a really, really, really disordered, terrible time in my life. And a year prior, I had just published this book called Peak Performance. So you can imagine what a fraud I was feeling like, among other things. Um, and I remember about four months into uh, my recovery, going to my wonderful therapist and just telling her that I can't even find growth or meaning in this. This all just feels so pointless. And she looked at me and she said, well, why do you have to grow from this? Like, Why does this have to be meaningful? And I said, because like you, I've read millions of these books. He's like, well, because all these books are telling me that I'm supposed to grow and everything needs to be meaningful. And she said, you know, 99% of things can be meaningful, but sometimes things just suck. And your job isn't to find meaning in this. It's not to grow from it. It is to learn how to be kind to yourself and just get through. Because it took a lot of self-discipline to get through, which also required a lot of self-compassion. And um, putting that extra pressure on myself to grow or to find meaning just didn't make sense. Then fast forward years later and working on this book project, what I realized is that it's a trap that a lot of people fall into. And even here, I try to be fairly non-judgmental, non-prescriptive, because if you can grow and make meaning from hardship in the moment, you absolutely should. But if you try to do that and it feels like you can't, then it's okay to release from the need to do that altogether. And what the research shows really clearly is that for these really hard events, we might not grow or make meaning from them acutely while we're experiencing them. But if we just get to the other side of them, generally speaking, when we look back on them five years later, 10 years later, we do tend to grow and make meaning, even if all there is from it is compassion. We just learn to be kinder to ourselves and others, but you cannot force that process. It has to occur on its own time. As one of my kids once said to me in one of these moments, even though I knew I was not in the business and shouldn't be in the business of advice giving, I was 
trying to just change the subject for a moment. And uh, he said to me, I'm, I'm sure that's true, but I'm not ready to take a life lesson from this yet, you know, um, which of course oh, is the great. Lies. Yes. And uh, one of the great, wonderful things about the wisdom of kids is it comes back at you again um, and again and again. Um, let's talk about, about the list of values because the way you write about it, values are, they feel like in these moments of change, and now we're talking about that kind of more quotidian change. I mean, if what we do with our habits determines our lives, this is the stuff that determines our lives. I mean, it's it's not trauma that, of course, can determine in a life. But I mean, the, the way I've been thinking about change after reading your book is it's just, it's really there with us all the time. And so this is the management technique for weathering it, shaping it, living in it, in conversation with it. So explain the role that that values play um, in that and what you would say to somebody who's like, well, I don't... I, I don't know what my core values are. Yeah, this is um this is where the book gets really practical. So values are the qualities and characteristics towards which you most aspire. And when you feel like you're living in alignment with them, you feel like you are um, doing well and, and it causes you also to feel well is a byproduct. So some examples, presence, strength, kindness, compassion, intellect, wisdom, creativity, health, family. Uh, so on and so forth. There's a list of the 100 most commonly held core values in um, in the book. And when you identify a set of core values, the research shows that the magic number is somewhere between three and five. They become an internal dashboard for you, uh, meaning that when you live in alignment with them, again, you feel good and you do good, you do well. Uh, however, they can't just be posters on the wall or you know, written on your bathroom mirror, you actually have to live these. So for each core value, I encourage readers to really define it in concrete terms and then come up with ways that you can practice it in day-to-day -day life. And then when you are confronted with a big change, those values become the ground that you stand on because the path forward might not be clear, but you can always ask yourself, what are my values and what would it look like to act in alignment with them? And I'll say one more thing for the listeners out there that might say, well, this sounds nice, but like, is it rigorous? And, and the answer is yes. It's one of my favorite studies in the book. Uh, researchers at the University of Pennsylvania had study participants either reflect on their core values, like we're talking about now, or just read a magazine. And then they put them into an fMRI machine where they could look at their brain activity. And while they were in there, they read to them really challenging, dramatic life change situations. For these people, it related to health behaviors. And what they found is that the people that did not reflect on their core values, that had just read a magazine, they showed lots of brain activity in the parts of the brain associated with a fear and anxiety response. Whereas the people that reflected on their core values, they showed significantly less fear, and they actually approached the change as a challenge. And What's even more interesting is they followed these participants for the next three months, and not just in their brain, but in the real world, those that reflected on their core values were better able to make these changes. So there's a real scientific backing here um, to the value of knowing your values um, and being able to shed some fear. Because without any rudder, without a compass going into a storm, it's terrifying. It's still scary if you have that rudder or you have that compass, but at least you have some ground to stand on. And, and I argue that's what our core values are. At Arizona State University, we offer a variety of programs online designed and taught by a renowned faculty to empower your success. That's why 87% of ASU online graduates stated they were promoted or received an increase in salary after earning their degree. Visit asuonline.asu.edu. Hey, this is Mary Harris, host of Slate's daily news podcast, What Next? Slate's mission has always been to cut through the noise, boldly and provocatively. This election season and Supreme Court term are no different. Important coverage like this, though, it would not be possible without the support of our Slate Plus members. So I'm going to invite you to join us with a special offer. 
you can try your first three months for only 15 bucks. That is five bucks a month for your first three months of uninterrupted ad-free listening on every Slate podcast, member-exclusive episodes and segments of your favorite shows like Amicus and the Political Gap Fest, and unlimited reading on the Slate site. Best of all, you'll be supporting all of Slate's independent journalism and analysis as we make sense of the news like no one else can. Sign up for Slate Plus at slate.com slash podcasts plus. Again, that is three months for only 15 bucks. So sign up now at slate.com slash podcast plus. You have practical guidance along this way, which I really liked, which is... um, so you have the list, which is which is great, but then you also have sort of action items to help people kind of get in, get um, understand at least the, the the preliminary contours of of their, uh, let's say they choose empathy as their you know some specific tasks. Give us an example of one task or something on a, on a value that would help people kind of understand the shape of their own uh, value system. Let's say that one of your values is love, very noble value. Um, Then I would say, well, how do you define love? So one definition of love, and it's one that I use, is being fully present and attentive for the people and activities I care about most. To me, that is how I demonstrate love. So then I'd say, all right, well, now I have this value. I have this definition. How do I practice it? And there, we get deep into the weeds of, I'm going to put my smartphone and my laptop in the garage during dinner so I'm not distracted by it so I can really be there for my wife and kids. Or when I sit down to write, I'm going to make sure I do it in an environment without distraction. So you go all the way from love down to where is your smartphone during dinner. During times of change or turbulence, again, you can ask yourself, what would it look like to practice love? What would it look like to be really present for what I care about and try to protect what I care about in this circumstance? Um, I think another important thing to to mention here is oftentimes people will say, all right, so I have this list. There's a hundred. They all sound good. You're asking me to get to three to five. How on earth am I supposed to know what my core values are that are going to become my internal dashboard and my compass for change? Um, In here, the psychology research shows that Ironically, the best way to get deep into the contours of yourself is to create some distance from your current self. You can imagine that you're 10, 20, 30 years down the road looking back on current you. What would older you be proud of? That's one really good inroad to your core values. One that I like is you can look to people in your life that you really admire. And these can be people that you know, but these can be people that you've never even met. But for whatever reason, they're out in the public eye and there's something about them that you really admire. Well, what is that thing that you admire? And that's a really good inroad to a core value. So I just went through this exercise myself um, because I don't really do New Year's resolutions. I do a values inventory. And I've had a lot of change in my own life and it's been a minute since I revisited these. And someone who I admire, I know whom you admire as well, is Jason Isbell. And, but I never really stepped back and said, well, obviously his songwriting is otherworldly, but like, what is it that I'm so smitten with this man? Why do I admire him so much? And the value that came out was just truth. He just tells his truth in the truth. And I said, huh, well, maybe I'm entering a phase of my life where that ought to be a value that I live, that I prioritize. And then, of course, it's about, well, how does that define and manifest in my own life? It's one of the ways, I guess, one of the other ways in which people think about that is think about, you know, your eulogy, not your resume. What's in the eulogy? What do you want them to to say you were, you know, you were always kind, compassionate or, you know, he he drew he drove a really nice GTO. You know, it's it's, uh, you know, how does that um, um, tell me? Tell me what tragic optimism is before we run out of time. So tragic optimism um, is a term that was coined by Viktor Frankl, um, Holocaust survivor, psychoanalyst, um, most known for his work on man's search for meaning. Uh, But he wrote this much lesser known essay that he simply titled The Case for Tragic Optimism. And in the essay, Frankl says that being a human, we will all face tragedy. It's unavoidable. And he lists three reasons for this. Uh, The first is that we're made of flesh and bone, and our bodies will have aches and pains. They will hurt. 
The second reason is that we have a prefrontal cortex, so we can make plans and our plans don't always work out. So we'll experience some frustration in our life. And then the third reason is the hardest, which is that we are the only species that knows that we and everything we love will eventually die. And just knowing that is a real tragedy. So Frankel, in a complete retort to what today we'd call toxic positivity, says enough with being a Pollyanna. Like the work of a mature adult is actually to accept that this tragedy is inherent to the human existence. And, and at the same time, in spite or maybe even because of all this tragedy, we can work to maintain hopefulness and optimism nonetheless. And I find this so freeing. We don't have to wallow in nihilism or despair. We don't have to pretend that everything is okay and hunky-dory always. We can embrace the complexity of both. And we can realize that even in a single day, we can go through this whole span of emotions. And, and in today's world, there is so much that's tragic, but there's also so much that's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, Chesterton said, hope is the power of being cheerful in circumstances we know to be desperate. And I know cheerfulness is not what we're talking about here, but but the idea of of knowing that things are this way and yet being able to persevere um, is really uh, powerful. So you and I have lived a few years. A lot of our, our listeners will have lived enough years so that they have some of their own examples to kind of match against this. They've been through periods of change. They've felt that transition. What do you do? What would you say, what's your guidance for those, I've been thinking a lot about college because the kids are in college, but also my own experience there and the beginning of identity formation that I associate with that period, because you have enough independence to really make your big first mistakes, your first job. How do you think about identity formation and this idea of becoming comfortable with change at that stage when you're, when you're learning all the rules at the first time? Hmm. I like the metaphor of a canvas and you you have this canvas that maybe by age 18, 19 is an undergraduate student. Um, this is when you look in the mirror, there's kind of just like a you there that you know, and it's probably the same you that you still see when you look in the mirror now. Um, my grandma who's in her 80s says, I look in the mirror and I see this old woman, but I still feel like this this young adult. And that's like the canvas, you know, that is your essential kind of awareness of who you are. But then throughout life, you're going to have all kinds of paint and texture added to that canvas. And the canvas is always there, um, but the paint and texture is going to change based on your life experience. Um, and I think that, again, it's non-dual thinking. It's kind of holding on to both of these ideas at the same time and then not foreclosing yourself into any one identity, um, whether it's a career, whether it is a certain way of viewing the world. Um Identifying with values, not things. Tell me a little bit about your process and how, you know, this book worked, you, how you think about work that you do, you know, day to day on Instagram, which is incredibly nourishing and helpful because it, it puts, you know, in your book, in this book anyway, there's a, you know, the more regularly these ideas are in your head, I feel the better it is. And so how do you decide what to do? at book length, what to do on podcasts, what to do Instagram and any other format in which you, um, you know, uh, semaphore or whatever else. I wish I had a rigorous process that I could tell you about. It's a lot, it's a lot messier than the output, um, as is always the case. In short, I, I write about topics that I want to read a book about. So like I write the book for myself first. I mean, this is a conversation I have with myself all the time. Um, and then obviously I, I try to make sure that it's something that readers and my readers would, would find interesting. Um, and then I just think about meeting people where they are. I mean, that's me practicing my values. For a while, I thought of myself as a writer. And I realized that was kind of narrow. Like I'm more of a creative or a communicator. I try to be a, a source of wisdom. And that means doing podcasts. And that means posting on Instagram. And I don't have to like all these things. Um, but I, I ought to at least give them a shot. So I guess my process is kind of saying, what's the medium? And then what am I trying to accomplish with it? In a book, because deep down inside, I am a writer. Um, a book is the foundation. It's the chassis. And the book is the priority. And when I write a book, I for six months to a year, I am just in the world of that book. 
Uh, but when I come out of that world, the work isn't done. And that's where it's about, well, how can I get these messages on a social media post? Um, how can I figure out interesting ways to talk about them in conversation, so on and so forth, ultimately hoping that, that people will come and read the book? Yeah, well, it is, um, it's a great book and, um, and I love it also. It's, um, it has two of the things I really, well, three of the things I like. It has stories in it. It is not just um, kind of a lot of uh, stuff in the air. It's it has practical guidance. Um, it's not excessively long. Um, I think we've all felt those books in the world that are, um, you know, you feel like this could have been a long article. Uh, no, it feels like it is at the length that it should be. Um, and Brad, it was a it was a real joy to read and a, a great pleasure to talk to you. So thanks for being with us. Yeah, thank you, John. I appreciate you. That's it for this month's edition of GabFest Reads. Our producer is Shana Raw. Ben Richmond is Senior Director of Operations of Podcasts. Alicia Montgomery is Vice President of Audio at Slate. We'll be back next month with another edition of GabFest Reads. Until then, all three of us will be back in your feed on Thursday with a new episode of the Slate Political GabFest. <laughs>